The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, April 9th, and we have the DDA waiver programs, application and services. The Developmental Disabilities Administration welcomes you to the DDA educational series. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. This webinar is open to all stakeholders and will be recorded and put on the DDA website. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options for listening to the webinar, by computer and by phone, and if you have trouble hearing, you may switch modes by clicking on the appropriate button on the webinar panel. There are handouts for the webinar, which you can find in the handout section, and they can also be emailed if you email me, Donna Will, at donna.will at maryland.gov. We will be recording today's webinar and we will send the link in a follow-up email that goes out to all who registered. Questions can be typed in the question box, which is in the webinar panel, and they will be read and answered out loud, as long as they relate to the topic on DDA waiver programs. So now I'd like to introduce Patricia Sastoki, DDA's Director of Programs. Hi, Donna. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Oh, and we're so excited that we get to do this one more time and be able to share with the group where we are. So today, um, I have with me the Director of Federal Programs, Wanda Workman, uh, who is going to enlighten us with all this wonderful information about our Medicaid waiver overview. What is a Medicaid waiver? What is DDA waivers, uh, DDA waiver application process? Um, we've been talking a little bit about the eligibility and persons in a planning. Now we're going to talk about, okay, now that you're DD eligible and you um, want to get services through our waiver services, how do you apply and what do we need to do with that? Then we're going to go into detail about each of the waiver services, meaningful day uh, services, support services, and residential services. I mean, we call those buckets um, because we have so many services. And then we're going to open it up for questions. So today is a, a pretty big day for us because we're going to not only talk about each of the services, but we're going to give some examples. We also want to let you know that we kind of uh, synthesize all of this from a 200 plus page document, which is our waiver application. So hopefully uh, this will um, be engaging for you. You can maybe learn more than you knew before. Um, but thank you for joining us today. So as usual, we're going to start with what is it that we're doing and what is our principles about all, what we do here at DDA. And we really do believe that all people have the right to live, love, work, learn, play, and pursue their life's aspiration in the community. And we're hoping that the services that we are defunding and providing uh, funding for really promotes that. Uh, we partner with people with development disabilities, families to, support, to provide supports and resources to fulfill their lives. Um, what is that trajectory? What does that look like? We provide a coordinated of service delivery systems that enable children and adults with intellectual and development disabilities and their families to work towards the self-determination, their interdependence, productivity, integration, and inclusion in all factors across the lifespan. Um, and this is really important for us, not only because we believe that people should live, love, and play in their community, but we also want to make sure the folks are being empowered. They're able to exercise the freedom of choosing what and where and with whom they want to do things with in the community. Uh, we are one of many, many, many resources and support available to assist individuals and families as they build their lives towards their vision for a good life. What does that look like? And, and we're hoping that throughout the seminars, the webinars that we've been giving you, that one hour, that 45 minutes, can give you just a little bit of information that will give you that knowledge to be able to advocate and, and talk about what do you expect for you, for yourself, for your loved one, if they're getting services from the DDA? Uh, so hopefully that this has been helpful. I know some of you said that you just joined us for the first time. We are uh, uploading all of this uh, webinars that we've done uh, to our DDA website. And once we put that up there, we will send to all the people that register where the links are so that you can revisit them at your leisure and you can keep pressing the play, hold, pause, button as many times as you like. Um, so as you know, we serve children, adults, and families. 
through all of our three waivers. And we really want to emphasize on how do we do that. We've talked a lot about our um, integrated star. What, uh, how do you look at the uh, a good life? What do we look at? And we, this really is a the integrated support star is really an opportunity for families, people in services, and even providers to look and see, okay, that star is that person. How do I make sure that we are helping and supporting or coaching or mentoring a person in services to that trajectory to a good life? Um, are they being, uh, are they working? Are they um, in the community? You know, so before considering various services and supports available under the DA waiver programs, it is essential to first consider the goals to support the person's vision of a good life. And this tool helps you. Um, and so hopefully you're able to listen more on this. We are going to invite Marianne Cambershi to be able to talk a little more about this in future webinars coming up, uh, hopefully in May. Um, so our next item um, is just, hey, who are we, where we are, um, and where can I get information? And so this is really important. Um, if you have a question about a service, about your son, your daughter, even you as a provider, or a person in services, where do I go to get information? Who should I contact? And so this information is here available for you to see that uh, we have a person, um, a regional acting director at the central office. We have Kim Gashado at the Eastern Shore, Judy Paddock at the Southern Region, and Kathy Marshall in the Western Region. And all these people are happy to be able to engage with you and provide any resources, additional guidance or information that you may have in reference to our waiver. So I'm now going to turn this over to the Director of Federal Programs, Rhonda Workman. Rhonda. So thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So we're going to first start and provide a little bit of an overview of what is a Medicaid waiver, because we often get that question. So. A Medicaid waiver is a federal medical assistance program, also known as a Medicaid program. And the reason why they're referred to as waivers is because some of the regular Medicaid rules are waived, that is, they're not applied. So um, it's not an entitlement program, um, and we can specify specific services that we want to deliver in certain populations. Waivers give states the flexibility um, to serve a variety of, of different populations. Our waiver program supports people with developmental disabilities. Um, we'll share some information about some other waiver programs, but it also provides an opportunity to provide services in innovative ways that are non-traditional than the typical medical systems. It's also important to note that the Medicaid waiver programs are not a grant. So it's not a state grant that when you're enrolled in the program um, that you're allocated to um, purchase services. It's actually a Medicaid federal program. So let's talk a little bit about eligibility requirements. All waiver programs have these um, basic waiver um, requirements. Individuals participating in these programs must initially and continuously meet the following criteria. The first is technical eligibility, and that's really specific to the waiver program. These are things like age requirements, diagnosis, and also having a service plan, or in our case, a person center plan, to meet the person's health and safety needs. The second is medical eligibility. And so part of the reason um, that we're able to provide waiver programs is, is the federal government um, provided this new option to support people in the community instead of providing services and in institutions, which is an eligibility entitlement under Medicaid. So therefore, to provide these services, the medical eligibility will relate to institutional care, such as nursing facilities, chronic hospitals, and intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities. And then the last category is referred to as financial eligibility. And this is based on income and assets. Um, important to know that when we're talking about waiver applications, that the income and asset is based on the applicant and not on the family unit. So therefore, if it's a child, then the eligibility is based on the child's income and assets. If it's an adult, it would be based on the adults, but the family's income and assets are not taken into consideration. Hey, Rhonda, can you tell the listeners a little bit about what do you mean about continuously? That's a great question. So. Um, as I mentioned, initially you must meet the criteria to get enrolled into the program. 
And then annually, we have to reassess or redetermine to make sure that the person continuously meets financial eligibility, medical eligibility, and technical eligibility. Therefore, it's extremely important that when you get information about providing additional information or updates related to income and assets or completing your annual person-centered plan timely, that it's really important to be responsive to maintain your waiver eligibility. So this slide is just giving you um, a visual of the various Medicaid home and community-based service waivers in the state of Maryland. The Developmental Disabilities Administration um, administers three of the eight. But on this slide and um, in your handout, you'll be able to click on each of these and it'll take you to a link that can provide additional information. But the state of Maryland does have a waiver program specific for people with autism, people with brain injury, the community option waiver serves um, adults 18 and above and provides a variety of community services um, to include assisted living services. We'll talk a little bit more about the community pathways waiver, the community supports waiver, and the family supports waiver in upcoming slides. And then the state of Maryland also has a medical daycare waiver that provides services in a medical daycare um, program and also the model waiver for disabled children, which is um, supports for children with complex medical needs. So let's talk about the DDA waiver programs. The DDA administers the following programs on behalf of Maryland Medicaid. The Family Supports Waiver is a home and community waiver program designed to support children birth to 21 years old. It provides a variety of various support services that we'll share in the upcoming slides. This is considered a cap waiver, and so the annual person-centered plan budget upon initial enrollment um, cannot exceed $12,000. However, during the course of the year, if service needs change, we are able to approve services above that limit, provided those services are based on assessed need and available within the waiver. The Community Supports Waiver is designed to support children and adults. And you see that we've noted that we're going to provide our support services, but we've also added our Meaningful Day services to support our adults in terms of their pursuit of competitive integrative employment and community inclusion. This program has a cap of up to $25,000 um, to initially become enrolled. And then on an annual basis, we can consider increased needs um, based on the services that are being requested. And then finally, the Community Pathways Waiver. It's the oldest waiver in the state of Maryland, and it supports children and adults. You see that we're gonna provide um, all our meaningful day services, the support services, but we've also added our residential services. We often refer to this waiver program as a comprehensive waiver because it can serve all needs. So let's talk about how can I apply to the DDA Medicaid waiver programs. So in terms of the people that can apply, um, first, individuals need to meet the developmental disability eligibility criteria for the DDA. You may recall that we've talked about the DDA application process and our criteria related to making that determination. So once an individual has been determined to meet our developmental disability criteria, then they are in a sense meeting our medical waiver eligible, our medical eligibility criteria. So being DD eligible and the person also needs to be identified for potential funding. We shared in our previous webinar that the DDA has allocated dedicated funding for specific state priorities. We've listed them here. They include the emergencies, the court involved, people leaving an institution, youth leaving a, the foster care system, people on the DDA waiting list, and also transitioning youth when they're exiting the school system. Each category has specific criteria that needs to be met. And so if a person is DD eligible and we have funding in, in our priority category available, then we will be able to provide that opportunity to apply. So let's talk about that waiver enrollment process. So first, the person is determined eligible for a DDA funding priority. Next, their coordinator of community service would meet with the person and their, their family and representatives to facilitate the DDA waiver application packet. This packet is submitted to DDA for consideration of technical and medical eligibility determination. 
The packet then is submitted to the Eligibility Determination Division, known as EDD, for the Financial Eligibility Determination. And then finally, the person will receive a letter advising them of their enrollment or their denial with appeal rights accompanying them. So at a glance, um, this is the visual that we've been sharing in our previous webinars. And we've talked about the process for the initial DDA application all the way through the waiting list and getting your priority category um, and eligibility determination. So what we're talking about today is the next step. So the wave placement is really that identification of the funding priority. And then from that, that then triggers the requirement to complete the waiver packet. So let's talk about what that waiver packet includes. The coordinator of community services will help the individual and their circle of support in completing a Medicaid waiver application. That'll include the request for additional information and documents related to income and assets. Remember, that is based on the applicant's income and assets only. The coordinator will also help to develop the first initial person-centered plan. We referred to and had detailed discussion about the person center plan in a previous webinar that you can refer to. In addition, a form referred to as level of care is completed. And this form is an indication that the person is meeting the medical eligibility for an institutional level of care. Again, that's one of the requirements for eligibility for the waiver. Next, they would be asked and provided the option and choice to receive services in the institution or to receive services in the community if they met the waiver eligibility. This form is referred to as the freedom of choice. So in a sense, the person is given the choice to again enter an institution for services or to receive them under the home and community-based waiver program. The next item is an eligibility determination division release form. This form is completed so that the coordinator of community services can get um, a copy of letters related to that annual financial redetermination and any other notices to, again, support the individual to continuously meet their waiver eligibility. And then finally, any additional supporting documentation can be provided to demonstrate assess need for services being requested in the person-centered plan or other documents to support information for the financial eligibility. As we noted here and shared in last week's call, the regional office program staff are responsible for reviewing the person center plan and authorizing it before the waiver packet can be submitted by the coordinator of community services to the DDA regional eligibility staff, who then would review the packet and authorize it based on the eligibility criteria. So now that um, we've done the application process, and, and in this situation, let's consider that we've been enrolled in the waiver program. Um, let's talk about the different services that can help to support um, a person. We shared in previous webinars that DDA has classified our services into three buckets. The first is the meaningful day services. Then we have support services and residential services. Remember, it's important to stay focused on the trajectory before you move into those services considered. A couple notes before we get into the specifics of the services. All waiver programs, the federal application includes details related to the specific services that have been authorized to be provided. These are all noted in what's referred to as Appendix C in the waiver application in reference to participant services. In Appendix C, there will be details for each service to include service descriptions, service requirements, limitations, service delivery models, such as whether it's available under the self-directed or person-directed or traditional services. It'll also include provider types and qualification requirements. So today, um, we're just gonna provide a general overview um, because as Patricia mentioned, the actual waiver program documents tend to be pretty large and have a lot of details in it. But we encourage you to refer to the specific waiver application associated regulations, policy, and guidance to, to learn and know more about the programs and requirements. It's also important that we wanted to share with you that we have recently submitted to the federal government, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, amendments to our waiver programs, and they are currently under review. Today's presentation will be based on our currently approved waiver program applications, 
and will also include some proposed changes that we submitted through our amendment. For up-to-date information regarding the amendments and the proposed changes um, that you can view, we've included the website page um, for you to be able to reference. So now let's get into the exciting services and start first with our Meaningful Day services. So this slide is just giving you a visual at a glance of the different services that are being provided. The way to read this chart is the FSW stands for the Family Supports Waiver. The CSW stands for Community Supports Waiver and CP is a reference to the Community Pathways Waiver. As we mentioned in our overview, our Meaningful Day services are only available in our Community Supports Waiver and Community Pathways Waiver as they are designed to support adults. So now we'll talk about some of the details of the different services. So the first service is referred to as supported employment. And this is a legacy service that we've had for some time. Supported employment provides a variety of supports to help people identify their career and employment interests, as well as to help them find and keep a job. So some of the examples here include individual job development and placement, on the job training and the work and work related skills, help and facilitation of developing natural supports in the workplace. It can include ongoing supports and monitoring of the individual's performance on the job. It can also include training and related skills needed to obtain and retain employment, such as using community resources and public transportation. It also includes help for negotiation with prospective employers and also self-employment. The next service is Employment Discovery and Customization. This service is a time-limited service meant to be a very comprehensive um, review process and exploration of people's interests. It includes the assessment of employer-related type jobs um, and looking at it in a variety of settings, looking at the surroundings of the person's home in terms of community employment opportunities, it looks at work skills and developing an interest inventory based on the individual's own um, preferences and interests. It includes community-based job trials and community-based situations in order to try out and identify skills, interests, and learning styles uh, for the individual. It can help with the identification of an ideal condition for employment for the person, which also could include self-employment for some. And it also includes the development of what we refer to as an employment discovery profile that includes information such as the skills, job preferences, possible contributions to the employer that the person can offer, and also um, useful social networks. Our meaningful day services in terms of our supported employment and our employment discovery and customization will be transitioning in July of 2020 to our new employment services. And so these are noted here. They're gonna include um, services that have been um, reflected and provided in our legacy services, but are gonna be enhanced with new best practices and increased and enhanced staff training and qualifications to include competency-based discovery and job development skills. So we're gonna have a webinar dedicated to our employment and meaningful day services and that's going to occur on April 23rd, for which our Director of Employment Services, Stacey Jones, will go into, into in depth about our Meaningful Day services and these new exciting services that will be coming available in July of 2020. The next service is Career Exploration, and Career Exploration is another time-limited service, and it's designed to help people learn, to, learn skills to work towards competitive, integrated employment and so there's a variety of different kind of learning that can occur, such as skills for employment, like time management, strategies for completing work tasks based on the person, socially acceptable behavior in a work, be a work environment, effective communi communication in a work environment, and also self-direction and problem solving for a work task. We have three different models under this service to include facility-based supports, where services are provided at a provider-owned and operated site, small group supports, and large group supports, where groups in different sizes would be um, accessing the community and completing jobs in different groups, um, such as enclaves, work crews, and government buildings, and other contracts. Our community development services are also um, available for people to help to 
to um, develop their meaningful day. And for this service, this includes supports to help develop and maintain skills related to community membership, through engagement in a variety of different activities with people without disabilities. This service is designed to be um, supported in groups, small groups of up to four people, but it could be in a group of one to one. And it includes a variety of things such as engaging in activities to help promote integration and inclusion in the person in their chosen community and also lead to their path towards employment. It includes supports for travel training, supports with self-advocacy classes and activities, participating in local community events, and volunteering. It's important to note with our CDS services, it does not include payment for activities, but it includes the supports um, to, for the person to be able to engage in that. These services are provided um, and begin in the community and also end in the community. So these services are not provided in our provider-owned and operated sites. Our day habilitation services are another legacy service that can provide a variety of development and maintenance of skills related to activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, and vocation and socialization skills through a variety of different formal teaching methods and participation in a variety of meaningful activities. Some examples relate to learning skills for employment, learning skills for socially acceptable behavior, learning skills for effective communication, learning self-direction and problem solving, engaging in safety practices, performing chores in a safe and effective manner, and performing um, self-care. These services are again provided in a provider owned and operated site, but also are also provided in the community and can be provided in a variety of groups to include large groups, more than four. Our medical daycare services are a medically supervised day program, which includes a variety of medical supports that can be available to support the individual based on their assessed need. So you can see there's healthcare services, nursing services, physical and occupational therapies, assistance with um, activities of daily living, such as walking and eating, grooming and supervision of hygiene, nutritional services, social work services, um, they also include activity programs. It could be both at the site and also in the community and transportation services. So as I mentioned, um, we will be having additional uh, webinars specifically dedicated to Meaningful Day where Stacy Jones will provide um, more detailed information related to our Meaningful Day services and that will be conducted on April 23rd. In terms of our Meaningful Day services, we also wanted to share that they're available under the traditional and also self-directed service delivery model. And in terms of the self-directed service delivery model, there are two opportunities or what we refer to as authorities for which the person can exercise control. One is referred to as employer authority, where you would set wages, hire and fire staff, you could um, determine additional staff qualifications. And then the other is the budget authority, where you can move money related to that um, service that you're receiving. And so the chart here is demonstrating for supported employment services under the self-directed service delivery model, a waiver participant has the opportunity to have both employer and budget authority for supported employment. They also have the same, uh, both authorities under the community development services. But for employment discovery and customization, and day habilitation, they only have budget authority. For our new Meaningful Day services that will be available in July of 2020, um, they'll also have the opportunity for budget authority. For additional information about self-directed service delivery model, we're also having a webinar that will be dedicated to provide additional information about these two authorities I mentioned, and that's going to occur next Tuesday on April 16th, so we hope you'll be able to join us. So now let's talk about our support services. And you can see from this slide, we have a variety of services under our support services that can help individuals um, towards their trajectory towards a good life. We're gonna give you a little bit of information about each of these services. But on this um, chart, I also just wanted to highlight um, the red um, um, icons that say new um, are reflecting that we have proposed in our amendment to add our nursing services to the Family Supports Waiver. 
So those are not currently available, but we have proposed to CMS to provide those for which they would become available for the Family Supports Waiver in July. So let's talk a little bit about what those services are. So our assistive technology and services um, has a variety of different um, supports in it. And so assistive technology can help to maintain or improve functional abilities um, for individuals. It can help enhance interactions. It can support meaningful relationship. It can support um, um, employment. It can promote the ability to live independently and meaningfully participate in the community. And so you can see there's a variety of things that we cover on this, including an occupational therapist to complete a needs assessment to identify appropriate technology to meet the person's need. It includes the purchase of programs and materials and development of adaptive materials. It includes training and technical assistance for the person and their support network in using that um, assistive technology. It includes repair and maintenance of the device and equipment programming and configuration of the item, coordination of use of the technology with other therapies, interventions, and services, and also consists of purchasing or leasing the devices. So the next two slides are just some visuals of the different types of technology kind of categories. So technology is very broad, changes every day, but there's a variety of different supports that can help people in terms of speech and communication devices, blind and low vision devices, deaf and hard of hearing devices, devices for computers and telephones, such as the alternate, alternate mice and keyboards, and also environmental control devices like activating lights, fans, and door openers. There's also aids for daily living, cognitive supports that can be um, provided, in addition to remote support devices to help with health monitoring like blood pressure bands and personal emergency response systems, and also adaptive toys and specialized equipment to support children, such as specialized car seats and adaptive bikes. The next support services is our behavioral support service. And under behavioral supports, we have actually three different um, service supports. The first one is the behavioral assessment. And the assessment is used to help to identify challenging behaviors um, that an individual um, may be exhibiting and the reasons behind it. So it involves collecting information and looking at data, discussing information with the person and their support team, and if warranted, developing a formalized behavioral plan based on um, the state of Maryland regulations. For individuals that do have a formal behavioral plan, then there's the ability to have ongoing behavioral consultation. And so behavioral consultation provides a professional who would do ongoing monitoring and overseeing that implementation of that behavior plan and also modifying and revising it as needed. And then we have our brief support implementation services. And these are time limited services to help provide support for the individual um, network in terms of maybe their job or their family. Um, or their provider for residential services in terms of implementing that behavior plan. So you can see there's an array of services that are available um, under our behavioral supports. Our environmental assessment is an on-site assessment of the person's primary residence, so their home, and in consideration of any modifications or technologies that may be necessary to help the person to become more independent and to be safe in their home. So this would include the assessment of the person, looking at the environmental factors of the participant's home, looking at the person's ability to perform their activities of daily living, looking at their strength, range of motion, and endurance, looking at the need for technology or modification, and also um, considering the support network in terms of the family member's capacity to support that independence. Based on that environmental assessment, then an environmental modification uh, may be needed, and the modifications are physical modifications to the person's home based on that assessment. Examples include installation of grab bars, it could be accessing or installing ramps and railing, detectable warning or walking surfaces, alerting devices, adaptions to electrical, telephone, or lighting systems. It could also include a generator to support people with medical or health needs. Um, based on um, the needs of the person. Then we have our, uh, oh, I'm sorry, then we have additional examples here, um, such as widening doors, door openers, installation, bathroom modifications, and kitchen modifications um, that could be considered. 
Then we have our family and peer mentoring supports. And this is an opportunity where a mentor can be paired with a participant or a um, family member to help share experiences um, and community resources and programs and strategies that they've used to achieve their goals. It helps to foster those connections and relationships. Um, it's all provided by an experienced peer mentor, parent, or other family member to a peer, and another parent or family member who is the primary unpaid support to the participant. And we also can support siblings um, and having siblings have a match with a peer, another sibling pair. Our family caregiver training and empowerment services includes a variety of educational materials, training programs, workshops, and conferences to help the unpaid family caregiver in terms of understanding the disability of the person they're supporting, helping them to achieve greater competence and confidence in it, developing and accessing community resources, developing key parenting strategies, developing advocacy skills, and helping to support the person as they develop their own self-advocacy skills. We have also a service referred to as individual and family directed goods and services. Um, this service is specific for people who are self-directing or using the self-directed service delivery model. And the intent of these services are to decrease the need for Medicaid services, increase community integration, increase the person's safety in the home, or to support the family in the continued provision of the care of the person. The services, the equipment, or the item needs to relate to a need or goal identified in the plan. Um, they should maintain or increase independence, promote those opportunities, um, and that the service or items should not be available under the waiver services or state plan. We have designated um, dedicated funding up to $500 to also support the person who is the employer of record in terms of staff recruitment and advertisement of their staff under that employer authority um, and help such as examples of using flyers and also using staffing registries. Um, there's a variety of um, uh, supports that can be available related to this. Um, this is like the same slide, yeah. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about our housing support services. Our housing support services are another time-limited support to help um, participants um, 18 and above in terms of navigating housing opportunities and supports to help address and overcome barriers related to housing and securing and retaining housing. So there's a variety of housing information assistance to help people understand and apply for Section 8 and federal vouchers to get on our the Maryland Housing Registry, um, help to develop housing transition services, um, and to include a housing plan to address challenges such as maybe credit history or background challenges, being a good tenant, um, and also sustaining services um, so the person can continue to live in those uh, the, the housing of their choice. Our live-in caregiver supports provide supports to pay for additional cost of rent and food that can be reasonably attributed to an unrelated live-in personal caregiver. The caregiver supports are noted specifically in an agreement that will outline the service expectations, the arrangements for termination procedures, and recourse for unfulfilled obligations and monetary considerations. So in other words, there's an agreement between the person and the living caregiver support in terms of providing um, direct care and support for the individual in exchange for paying for their portion of the rent and a food allowance. This service is not available in situation where the person lives with their own family member, um, the caregiver's home or residence owned or are leased by a DDA licensed provider. Next, we'll talk about our nursing services. The first one is our nurse consultation. And this service is specifically for people who are self-directing or using the self-directed service delivery model. And this provides a registered nurse who can provide consultation and review information about the person's health. And based on that review, provide some recommendation to the person on how to have their needs met in the community. And in collaboration with the person, help to develop care protocols for the participant to use when the participant trains staff. Our nurse health case management services provides a licensed registered nurse when direct support staff are employed by a DDA provider agency to perform health services other than medication and treatment administration. 
So this would include the review of the person's health and supports as part of a collaborative process, assessing, planning, implementing, coordinating, monitoring, and evaluating various options and services to help meet the person's health needs, and using available resources to promote the quality of the person's health and outcomes in a cost-effective way. And then finally, we have our nurse health case management and delegation services. And under this service, they would provide the same scope under the nurse health case management. But in addition, they will also provide delegation nursing tasks to unlicensed individuals who would be performing acts on behalf of the licensed nurse as required in the Maryland Board of Nursing regulations. This service is available under both the self-directed and traditional service delivery model. Then we have participant education, training, and advocacy supports. Um, so this is an opportunity for participants to access training, workshops, and conferences to enhance their skills. It includes enrollment of fees, books, education, and materials, and, tra and transportation. Then we have personal supports that are supports um, that can help the individual who lives in their own home or their family home. It includes um, in-home skills development. We've got some examples such as budget, money management, meal preparation, and other items. And also community integration, engagement skill development, such as um, shopping in the community, banking, volunteering, participating in community activities, and such. Our remote support services provides an opportunity for people to have more independence and reduce the reliance on um, staffing. So this includes electronic support system installation, repair, and maintenance of systems um, to support individuals, training, technical assistance, off-site system monitoring, and standby intervention staff. We also provide respite services, which are meant to be short-term care to provide relief to the primary caregiver. It can be provided in the person's home, a respite care provider, a licensed site, a certified camp, or other settings approved by DDA. Our amendment proposal includes increasing the 360 hours to go up to 720, so we're doubling the hours per year, um, with also an option to approve above those based on unique circumstances, in addition to continue to offer um, the funding towards camp. Our support broker services is a support for people under self-direction, and they provide supports related to employer-related information and advice. So that information, coaching, and mentoring can um, support individuals in terms of their roles and responsibilities as a common law employer. They can support them and mentor them related to risk and responsibilities, choice and control, and other practical skills. It's important to note that the support broker does not make any decisions for the person, sign off on service delivery, or timesheets, or hire or fire staff. Then we have our transition services that support people who are moving from an institution or a congregate setting out to their uh, own home. And so it can provide some supports and funding related to setting up a home, such as security deposits, household items, such as furnitures, um, utility setups, um, pest removal and cleaning, and also moving expenses. We also have transportation services, which is a service to support independently accessing community activities in the person's own community. Again, a variety of different supports to include orientation services, accessing mobility, travel training, um, transportation through different methods, prepaid transportation cards, in addition to mileage reimbursement. And then finally, our last um, support service is our vehicle modifications, which are adaptations to um, people's vehicles to help make them more safe and um, support people being able to access the community. Um, so you can see that um, based on that, um, it would be the installation of the, the item, um, covers non-warranty vehicle modification repairs, and then training on the use of it. Here's an at a glance in terms of the self-directed service options that are available that you can refer to um, if you're going to utilize that method. And then um, to talk a little bit about our residential services quickly before we open for questions, um, you see they're only available in our community pathways waiver, and a couple of them um, are coming on. One is beginning in July of 2019, and our other one in July of 2020. So our community living group home services are provided in a provider-owned and operated site. They provide a variety of services and supports to help people with their activities of daily living, instrumental activities, socialization, 
um, and also community accessing their community. You can see examples include learning socially acceptable behavior, effective communication, problem solving, safety practices, household chores, self-care, and skills for employment. Our community living enhanced supports are very similar to our group home, um, with the exception that they're really specifically designed to support people who exhibit challenging behaviors or who have court-ordered restrictions. And because of that, we have increased qualifications um, and requirements for training for the supports that are available in this service. Um, so there's um, additional um, qualifications related to it. Our shared living services is a um, arrangement where an individual, a couple, or family um, in, invites a person to come into their home and share their lives. So they're developing a new family unit. It facilitates the inclusion of the person into the daily life of the new home. Um, and then it's an arrangement, again, um, where it could be an individual couple, couple or family. And then we have our supported living service. It's a new service coming available July of 2019. It's a variety of individual supports um, that can help people in a variety of different self-direction and problem-solving areas, activities of daily living and instrumental activities. Um, the person lives in their own home of choice, so they're not living with their family member. Um, they would have their own lease and have tenant rights. Um, they can choose to have roommates if they want related to this service. In terms of self-directed service option, our new supported living will provide an opportunity for budget authority. And so just to kind of pull it back all together in terms of our process, we reviewed the waiver application process um, and the waiver packet and reviewed the different services. So Rhonda, why do we have so many services? So that's a great question. Um, we have a variety of services to support individuals in their trajectory towards their good life. And we recognize and know that people are all individual and have different needs and different natural and community supports. So we're providing those options to support people. So this concludes um, a probably 223 page document we narrowed down in a 45 minute presentation. Um, there's more details. Oh, we do want you to join us on April 16th. We're going to talk more about self-directed services. And April 23rd, where we're going to talk about employment and meaningful day. Um, as you know, we've had either employment or rehabilitation, and now we've added a flavor so people can braid, stack, and blend services when it comes to people's meaningful day and what does that look like. So please join us uh, for that one, those webinars um, the following Tuesdays. Um, we're going to now open it up for questions, so if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Um, I know it was a lot of information, but this is all the 40, all the services that we have in our waivers. And we wanted to do a comparison of what was in the family supports, the community supports, and the uh, community pathways waiver or comprehensive waiver. So I'm going to open up the last for questions and I'll read. Oops, sorry. Okay. Maybe that box. Donna, are you seeing questions in the box? Okay. So some folks have asked about presentations, uh, and we're trying to upload them into our DDA website. Donna, do you see any questions? Yeah. Um, there's lots of questions. <laughs> I don't see them on my, on my screen. Can you read them to us? Um, sure. Can you go over the financial eligibility requirements again? Oh, here we go. So financial eligibility is one of the three um, eligibility criteria, and it's based on income and assets. Um, it's completed by the Eligibility Determination Division, who will look at um, the information provided in terms of bank statements, trust, life insurance, things like that. Um, they also have access to um, Social Security and other information um, in order to make a determination about eligibility. Medicaid has a variety of um, uh, coverage groups, and so individuals who apply to the waiver program can have an increased income of up to 300% of SSI, which is above the community Medicaid standard. 
And so it's kind of complex. The best thing I would I would say is just to, it's important to be responsive and provide the information so the determination can be made. Great. We can see the I questions see now. Them now. Um, is the model waiver the only way for a child to receive Medicaid as family of one or eligibility of one? Um, that is to be eligible for Medicaid without looking at the family income? Thanks. So um, that's a great question. For the DDA waiver programs, um, and I know the autism waiver um, are also has the same standard. So the applicant, whether it's a child or an adult, is the one that income and asset is being considered. The family is not considered. Can you talk about all what is required to comply with the community settings rule? So um, that's a great question, and I'm going to answer it in terms of the services. So from the community settings rule, um, a provider-owned and operated site, such as our um, community living group home, would need to comply with that. Um, the rule requires that um, people have the right to um, decorate the room, access to food, have visitors, uh, have an accessible environment. So there's specific federal requirements in terms of a community setting that has to meet. If someone is significantly impaired autism and has a one-to-one -one designated in IEP, um, has issues with safety, regulation, self-care, um, and will their eligibility level of care be impacted if he or she receives a high school diploma? So that's a great question. And as we mentioned in our previous webinars, the first step would be to apply to the DDA and be determined whether you meet the state uh, regulatory requirements um, for the DDA uh, administration. And so really we look at each individual in terms of whether they would meet the initial eligibility and then the waiver eligibility. Um, do making a smart home adaptations fall within the environmental service modifications? So um, it, and environmental modifications are going to be, again, based on that environmental assessment. Um, and so... And that assess need of the person. And the assess need of the person. So um, that would be the first place to start would be with the environmental assessment. How do families of TY students access family peer mentoring supports as they transition to self-directed traditional service models? So that's a great question. Um, transitioning youth as they're applying to the waiver programs um, can put that as a service, um, an assess need for that service, and it would be considered with the initial person-centered plan. Is Uber considered a public transportation service that can be approved through self-direction? Uber is a service that could be approved through our transportation services, yes, and self-direction. Okay, our CCS says our support broker still has to sign uh, timesheets, staff timesheets. So that um, appears to be a, um, an error in communication. We'll be following up to reinforce that with our, our coordinators of community services. I'm still struggling a little to understand how things are budgeted and paid for. Can you help me with the concrete example? My daughter participates in a swimming program at a community college. There are costs associated with the program and costs to, uh, cost to transportation her there. How would the fees for the pool be included and an aid to drive her uh, there plus the mileage? So that's a great question. And as I mentioned during the presentation, Federally, um, these waiver programs do not pay for activity fees. So um, individuals um, who would like to participate in um, swimming classes, community um, classes, um, things within their community can do so utilizing their own personal resources. The waiver program could provide support in terms of a staff, if the staff is needed to support the person, or transportation, but would not pay for the pool fees. Okay. If support services are approved, who is responsible for coordinating, organizing, example, agency, CCS, DDA, individual family, the approved service? So um, when you develop your person-centered plan and identify the services based on the assessed need to support the trajectory, um, then you would identify the provider. So the provider of that specific support service would be responsible for coordinating and providing that service. Supported employment, where will that be under the new category of employment? 
I also understand self-directed participants will not have employment authority for supported employment. So does this mean that self-direction people will not be able to hire individuals to support them on a job? Or so are self-directed people going to have to hire an agency after a new waiver amendment is applied? So that's a great question. So in um, the new employment services, you'll see that we had information about um, job development and ongoing job supports and follow-on supports. And so that's where those supports would be um, located in there. The um, requirements under employment services includes the competency-based training um, for the new best practices and under employment supports. And so and the individual would need to identify someone who had those qualifications. My question regarding transition services. My son is moving from the family home to an apartment. What cost can be can get assistance with? My understanding is that there are difference in service available, availability. So we don't pay for transitioning from somebody's house to another program. It's only for institutional settings. Right, so the, the transition services is, is to support people coming from an institution like a nursing facility to a group home or their private residence or from a group home to a private residence. So again, the first thing you want to do um, is you want to think about the trajectory and the integrated star and where people are going and what supports are available, whether it's um, natural supports, technology, and those type of things before considering the waiver services. Where is the application to apply to provide services such as daycare services? So if you're a, provided in, a provider interested in providing one of our waiver services, um, I would refer you to our website. Um, the main page, if you could scroll down on the right side, there's a lot of information about the provider application and requirements. Is it still true that individual can only access one waiver at a time? Yes, people can only be a participant in one waiver at a time. Let's say that a person is under the family supports waiver and is under the services cap of 12000 for the um, initial year. When they are initially uh, reviewed and supports needs increase, um, the support cap of 12000 does this mean they stay in the family supports waiver or do they move into another community supports waiver? So that's a great question. And um, with our proposed amendment to CMS, the individual would stay in the family supports waiver as long as they met the eligibility and there were services to meet the person's needs so that you can exceed it after you are initially enrolled. How do you access the housing services under the Community Pathways Waiver, getting on a waiting list for a housing authority, for example? So in order to access the housing services under the Community Pathways Waiver, you need to be a waiver participant. Based on that, you would develop your person-centered plan to include your goals and your outcomes, and then based on your assessed need, you could request the housing support services. So do you have to have all the three criteria, technical, medical, and financial, to be eligible? Yes, you have to meet all three criteria. Okay. This is a uh, finance question. We're having a standard 529 college plan or Maryland ABLE account over 2,000 disqualifying applicants? So that's a great question. There are um, protections under the new Maryland ABLE account. Um, we are not the experts related to the financial eligibility, so I'm not able to give you a definite, but information would be considered, but it's my understanding the ABLE account is um, does, not count. does not count against your, your income or assets. Can the reimbursement of mileage under the transportation services be used for personal support? So that's a great question. Um, you'll see in our waiver applications that we are transitioning some of our services. Um, so currently under personal supports, a person can receive personal supports and in addition, the standalone transportation service. Um, in July of 2020, um, the rates and the service will change so that transportation is a subcomponent of personal supports. It's one o'clock, I'm gonna read one more and then we'll end the webinar. Uh, in supported living, if the parent owns the home but are not living in it and are renting to their child and friend, will DDA help with funding for the rent for a shared caregiver to help with supports? So that's a great question and it depends on um, the structure um, and your plan. 
if you're going to be providing providing the service under supported living, then the DDA would not be able to support living caregiver supports. Um, the Medicaid program does not pay for rent or room and board um, for participants, so that's something that would be not allowed. Thank you, everyone, and have a, pleas a blessed Tuesday, and hope you join us next Tuesday. Thank you. Bye-bye.